Welcome to the Philco 90 restoration project. The main focus of the previous installment was me talking about what I consider to be the essential, crucial tools you should try to get if you're starting out working on vintage electronics with a focus on radio. Now I want to put those to use. So, in a lot of projects I've posted in the past, I would typically acquire something, do a video where I do a visual inspection, do a kind of a tour of the chassis, maybe go over the service info, and then I would blow through it. Replace all the caps, any resistors or any other parts that look bad, then do a power-up. We're going to do this project more methodically using those basic tools I outlined. Now something I'm guilty of in the past is talking about powering it up. Or I just use the lazy blanket statement of don't do it. It'll, you, could, you could seriously damage something, hurt yourself, it'll blow up, burn down the house, whatever. I call that lazy because that's generally not true and it might be more helpful to explain what the real risks are what you, can, what you should be concerned about, what you should look for before you power something up. Now, there are several different types of radios. There are types that have one side of the AC line going right to the chassis, known as hot chassis sets. There are sets that don't have a power transformer and there is a C going all around underneath the chassis and the wiring but the chassis itself is floating. And then there's this type, which has a power transformer isolating the AC line from anything down here. I may talk about the other types in a separate video. I don't want to overcomplicate or confuse this project, so we're just going to focus on this particular radio. It has a power transformer. So what what I want to look for, what should I be concerned about before just plugging this in and turning it on. Well one, the condition of the power cord. Now this has what I do believe is the original power cord and plug. The cord is a bit frayed in spots but it's basically intact and where it is frayed I don't see bare copper sticking out. So possibly this could be used, at least for a power-up. What I would want to do is take an ohmmeter on these plugs and make sure that it's not shorted. Now this plug looks like it's been mashed, maybe stepped on. And I can see the bare copper strands here. That, uh, some of them, or they have, they have the potential of shorting this out. Also this is a bit loose, very loose. I think originally there was a piece of something covering this to support these and keep them spaced apart properly, that's gone. If one was very careful, one could plug this in. Uh, there, it's not too difficult. Ah. <laughs> After checking this with, with this with an ohm meter, if I really was pressed to power this up, I could do that. I would feel more comfortable replacing this, at least temporarily, with a modern line cord. I mean, use some common sense. This looks to be as old as a radio, which is from like 31, so what's that, 70, like 90 year old wiring. Do you trust it? Eh, not so much. All right, so there's that. So I'm gonna clip this out. See, it runs right through the chassis. They tied a knot on either side as a strain relief. That's another thing to check that there, make sure there isn't any, uh, the insulation isn't worn through there. And then it comes right over and is attached to two points on this big light block cap. That's the next thing we want to talk about. What is that? So here's the line cord coming in. It's going to this lug and I think that lug. So I'm going to clip this out and I will just tack it a new line cord probably right here or somewhere. I'm not going to bother threading it in and tying knots and all that because later on once they, assuming I get this radio working I'll probably hook up a reproduction uh, 
cloth covered line cord. All right, let's back up a little. So what is this going to in this radio? Well, I pulled out the schematic. There are three distinct flavors of Philco 90. One has push-pull 45 tubes on the audio output. Another type has push-pull 47 tubes on the output. This is the single-ended type 47 output. I believe it's in Class A operation. It's important to make sure you've got the right schematic before you start really diving in, if at all possible. So, this is the right schematic. There is the AC plug. And what is it going to? Well, there's the power switch. There's the power transformer. Before that, there are a couple capacitors. So even if this radio is turned off, if you just plugged it into the wall, you're putting voltage across a couple components. These are two caps connected in series with the center point going to the chassis. They show it as a ground symbol, but unless you hooked up a third wire to this chassis and grounded it, the chassis is not really grounded. It's sort of a common tie point for a bunch of stuff, but it's not going to earth ground. So essentially what we've got is two caps in series across the AC line. So why is that a concern? Well, that's this cap down here. It's just a plain old paper foil cap, two caps, encased in tar, put inside of a Bakelite tub. Well, with age, these caps start deteriorating and they get leaky. What does leaky mean? It means current starts flowing through them. So what can happen is, if it's very leaky, it will... The current inside, and just like a power resistor with current flowing through it, this will get hot. And if it gets hot enough, pressure will build up inside, tar will start melting, and wax will melting and oozing out. It can pop. I've seen it on a number of Filcos where a side of this big light was blown out, and there was paper and uh, foil sp uh, <laughs> spread around inside. So, at the very least, before plugging this in, take this out. You don't have to have it turn the radio on. It'll probably work fine without it, in fact, once it's restored. It's there to help filter line, or noise off the line, rather. Depending on your situation, you might not have that much noise on the line. It might not even be a factor, so... Anyways, at least to power it up, we need to get this out. Now it is a handy tie point. We've got the AC line coming in. There's a wire that's going off to the power switch in the front of the chassis. Kind of nice to be able to use this. Well, so what can we do? Well, let's take a closer look at it. So here's the AC line coming in. Goes to this lug, and that lug, and this third lug is going to the chassis. So there's a cap between these two lugs and between these two lugs. We want to disconnect those before we power it up. This is a realistic concern. This is not overblown. I've seen at least two Philco chassis where this capacitor had exploded. What happens? The cap inside is deteriorated. You plug it in. Some leakage current starts flowing inside here. And that generates heat. The hotter it gets, the more the wax and tar starts melting and bubbling. I imagine gas pressure builds up and this blows apart, sending paper and foil and tar and wax around the chassis. Now if that did happen, or you find a chassis where it's already happened, it's not the end of the world. Uh, you can clean up all the debris and maybe put in a new terminal strip or something and wire things back up the way they're supposed to be and uh, probably nothing else would have been damaged. Alright, so I'm going to disconnect those caps. You can try... So the caps are inside this block. There are little wires coming up through these brass eyelets wrapping around these lugs and they're soldered on. You can, you can clip them off here, but that little stub of wire may still bump into this. So the only way to really do it is to undo 
this screw which is going down to the chassis and then you can leave the wires connected usually and you can rotate this whole thing and flip it around and get the get the innards out of this block. It's open on the other side. It's literally like a Bakelite bathtub and the other side is exposed to the elements and when you flip it around you can dig out the insides. So I think that's what I'll do. Now, why would I want to power this up before doing anything else? What am I hoping to gain? Well, I'm hoping to see that the tubes light up. So I'll leave the rectifier tube out, put the other tubes in, and they should light up. Now, if I had the rectifier tube in, what are the realistic concerns? Well, there's two filter caps and a filter choke. That's the filter choke. Here's two filter caps. And it's by visual inspection, this one doesn't look right. This is, or was, a liquid-filled electrolytic capacitor. There was a liquid borax solution inside of this, plugged up with some rubber and pinched at the end of this, and there was a conductor coming out of the middle. And, well, it looks like a corroded battery, doesn't it? That is the dried borax crud that's oozed out and this cap is no longer a cap. I've never seen one of these that was any good. The liquid is almost always, uh, if not entirely dried out, there's not a whole lot left in there. So it's probably open, not shorted. This one looks a bit different. This may be a replacement done ages ago. And just looking at them visually, you can see they look different. And just from having looked at a lot of Filco radios, I know this is the old style. With this cap on top, this this is newer. This might have been replaced in the late 30s or early 40s, who knows when. Probably still bad though. So what would happen if these were both open and I turned the radio on, assuming everything else is more or less okay? There would not be... Uh, as much filtering on the B plus voltage which powers the whole radio as there should be so there'd be a lot of hum coming out of the speaker. Not the end of the, not the, end of the world. You would turn the radio on, you hear a loud hum. Uh, maybe the vibration could damage a fragile speaker cone. But that, that'd probably be about the only concern I would have, and then I would just turn the radio off right away because it'd be obvious it's not working properly. But nothing would probably be damaged. Now, the worst case scenario is that one or both of these is a dead short. And then a few things can happen. One, the 80 rectifier tube, which is on the other side of the socket, would uh, have a tremendous uh, load or strain put on it. Worst case, um, the heater would uh, break loose and short into one of the plates. Or cathode, well, yeah, with this type of rectifier, that, that's a possibility. Uh, or if it doesn't fail catastrophically, it will be forced to conduct more current than it was designed to, and it will start glowing red inside. Red plating, they call it. There are so many electrons streaming from the cathode to the plate that it's uh, causing it to overheat inside the tube. Eventually it will fail. Another possibility, if your rectifier tube does hold up for a while, you'll be putting too much current through your filter choke and you may burn it out. That's a pain to replace if you had to. Out of all these things we've talked about so far, uh, that would be a pain to replace. Also, potentially, if you put a lot of strain on it, you could burn out the power transformer. That would be very difficult to replace. Now, why would I even bother trying to power it up this early on before really doing much work? Well, that's one of the reasons. I want to see if this power transformer is good or not. If it's bad, if it smokes, uh, if I'm not getting the voltages I expect out of it, that could be a showstopper. Um, sometimes these can be pretty tricky to track down a replacement for, so that could settle the project indefinitely. Now, in my case, I do have 
another one of these chassis that's been extensively modified. However, I think it still has the original power transformer, which means effectively I have spare. So that's a good thing. But I still want to check that out. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, replace the power cord, uh, disconnect these two AC caps as best I can, leave the rectifier tube out, populate the other tubes, and try powering this up and test all the voltages coming out of the power transformer. I'm going to use this for my new power cord temporarily anyways. This is just a replacement line cord from my local home improvement center. Handy because it's already stripped and tinned on the end. So one side I will just wrap on this and then tack it on. And I just had the soldering iron in my mouth, that's why I was mumbling. Solder, 60, 40, rosin core, I think. Yeah, 60% tin, 40% lead. 44, I think, refers to the type of rosin that's in there. I use this for anything and everything. Just put a few spools years ago, and I don't even think about using anything else. Now there's a problem with this Weller tip. I'm not, I haven't quite figured out. If I let it sit idle for a while, it goes cold. And I don't, I won't, the only way I know I get it hot again is to turn it off and back on. I know there's a way to get it to not have to do that, but I have not read the owner's manual. And you know why? Because it didn't come with one. Or just a very basic one. You're supposed to go online to get the full version, which I have not gotten around to doing. Alright, so that's that side. Now the other side, I'm just going to throw some extra solder onto this and onto this just to make it stick better. There's a little bit of tinning on the end of this wire, as it, the new line cord as it came, but I'd like to put more on there so, they, so we'll go to better, get her better. So this is just temporary. I don't want to wrap these two together because we just have to unwrap them later. But there, that, that'll hold. Well, I could just do it and power it up like that, but uh, I'm going to grab some electrical tape and just throw a couple wraps around there just to make sure I can't touch anything else. And uh, then we should be good to go. Here's a new power cord with electrical tape wrapped around one of the connections, and I just realized I'm a dummy because I didn't run the power cord through the hole in the back of the chassis. So when I flip this chassis down, the edge of the metal can bite into this insulation unless I support it. I will disconnect this and run it through the hole, but I'm really anxious to power this up, so I'm just going to forge ahead anyways. Now I want to recap. What are the realistic concerns with powering up a radio like this as is? Number one, inspect the power cord. Two, uh, check for a Bakelite block or paper type caps or whatever, caps across the AC line. Uh, leave the rectifier tube out. If you have the rectifier in, keep in mind there's a potential of filter caps drawing an excess amount of current, which can do a few things. It can damage the rectifier tube or selenium rectifier, rectifier diode, whatever it may have. It could put excessive current through a filter choke and damage it. It could damage a fuel coil on a speaker. It could damage the power transformer. Those are realistic, practical concerns. Once you've addressed all those, I'd say go ahead and do a controlled power-up. What do I mean by that? You'll see in a sec. By controlled power-up, I mean control the power going into the radio. Just don't plug it right into the outlet directly. Dim bulb tester or a commercial device like this. Now, I have the radio off as far as I know, but never trust an old power switch. This could be shorted, so it's going to have power immediately. Now, unfortunately, you can't set the output power on this without turning it on, so I need to unplug the radio, flip this on. 
You can only see current or voltage. You can't see both at the same time. Right now I have it in current mode. I need to flip it to the output AC line mode and I'm going right to 117. Now something else we need to talk about. Very often in the forums and comments I see people talk about slowly powering it up on a Variac. I see that again and again and again without any explanation of why they're doing that. Notice I'm not. The only reason you would ever do that is if you're going to try to reform the electrolytic filter capacitors. These guys. We already know they look horrible. Almost guaranteed they're useless. And I'm taking the rectifier tube out. So they're not even going to be in circuit. So, zero concern about them. I mean, there is zero reason to do a slow power-up. I'm just going to turn the thing on with full voltage. This is the Type 80 rectifier. I pulled it out. We have no rectifier, no B+. All we're going to do is light up these tube filaments. So, with that being on 117, now this will droop a little bit when the device it's plugged into is turned on. But that's a good ballpark place to be, so 117. You can also see where your AC line is directly out of the output. And yeah, 124, 125. So I'm definitely glad that I dialed it back a little bit. Not a huge difference, but helps get the right filament voltage on the tubes. So yeah, that. Now we'll turn this on. Now we're in current monitoring mode on the 0 to 1.5 amp range. Okay, good. No current draw. The radio sh is turned off, assuming the power switch is good. Now I'm going to turn it on. Excellent. So we're drawing current, 1.5 amp range. We're down less than 0.5 amps. That's cool. Right away, you can see the pilot light is lit, and the other tubes are lighting up. Awesome. So we know a few things right away. Every tube is lighting up, including uh, the output tube. So there are three secondary uh, voltages for, for tubes. The look like the audio output tube had its own tap and that's glowing so that one's good. All the other tubes are in parallel, they're all lit so they're good. The third one is for the rectifier tube. We're not putting that tube in right now so we can't check that directly. What I can do is stick meter probes down into those holes. The larger holes are the filament, the other two are the plates. Between the larger holes, which have about 5 volts, between the smaller holes, I'm thinking somewhere between 3 and 400 volts AC. Switching to the tripod now, notice the current draw has gone down. When tubes are cold, the filaments draw more current. When they heat up, this will slowly drop off for about a quarter of an amp. That makes sense. I'm happy with that. Now, let's check some voltages first. I'm going to check the 5 volts on the rectifier tube. I'm just going to stick these probes right down into the socket holes for that tube. Let's see, I think these are the filaments. I'll take it, close to 5. Let's double check our output line voltage. Now, this thing isn't super accurate, it's probably within 5%. And yeah, it did droop off after I turned it on. So, let's go back and check that tube again. It's probably a little bit closer to 5 now. Oh, wow, can't beat that for 0.98. Alright, now secondary. Six hundred. I'll take it. You know, I wasn't sure where this would be. And I guess that makes sense. So at center taps, it'll be about 300 volts AC going to the rectifier. A Type 80 tube isn't super efficient, so it's going to lose like 50 volts or so. Um, then it's going to go through the filter choke, which will drop the voltage more. So our B plus will end up being 200 and something volts, I would think. I could gander at service info and see what it's supposed to be. Yeah, unfortunately I looked through the schematic and the parts locator and the parts list uh, and they don't list any voltages for anything. So, 
we're just going to assume that that's good. I mean, <laughs> it's better than zero. Uh, it's in the ballpark of what I was expecting, so we'll consider that to be good. So, fantastic. That's what you want on your first power-up. I suspect by now some of you are yelling at your computer screen that I'm wrong. Yeah, time for me to eat a little crow. I've been claiming that this chassis is 100% original. Wrong. It is not. Between doing a closer visual inspection and looking at the parts placement diagram, I realized that not everything matches. There have been some repairs. And thinking about it, uh, I should know better. That's what I get for being a little rusty with my early radio repair work. They didn't have caps like this when this radio was made. Uh, also, they would have been Philco branded, I'm pretty sure, even if they did. These three paper caps are not original. They are repairs. Visually, it's pretty obvious. So this cap is going... One end goes to this lug, one end goes to that lug. There's a capacitor inside this. The manufacturer would not have added one externally. There's already one inside, so why is this here? The one inside must have failed, and failed open. If it had failed shorted, this repair would do you no good, because these terminals are shorted together. So this must have failed open, or at least the cap inside lost a lot of its capacitance somehow. So they tacked one externally. Now that's a little odd because these early type caps tend to fail by getting leaky or shorting. Uh, perhaps they somehow disconnected the internal cap? Um, looks like the two little wire stubs though are still coming up and connected. But perhaps they did take this out and flip it around and maybe the insides have been dug out. I'll have to inspect to find out. Now they're not all like that. This one in particular, if we take a closer look, ooh, there's something missing. They cut this tab off. I suspect this junction used to be going to that tab. Perhaps the remains of that tab are in this solder blob somewhere. And then they tack the other end onto that. This other section, there must be two caps inside this block. The other section is still wired in, so I'm guessing that section is still good, or was still good. And then finally, this guy, which is going right across two terminals on this big light block. So all three of these will be going bye-bye. I'll be replacing the insides of these. This one with a broken off lug. Ah, there's enough of left stuff left there. I can tack the new... Uh, connect that resistor back up to there. Otherwise, I do have a small stash that I salvaged from other sets uh, of Bakelite blocks, but I, they do have a part number embossed in the side. Uh, I probably don't have the exact model number. Now, yeah, that's getting a little anal. You know, it's getting a little, <laughs> you know, you don't have to obviously have a part that has the exact part number on the side of it. We'll get into that later about how far do you really want to go when you're restoring one of these, but we're trying to keep this basic. We just want to get it to work. I just wanted to point out that, yes, this has been worked on. There are repairs. We're going to have to be careful because um, some of the, at least one lug was clipped off. So now I'm going to have to double check all the wiring, all the parts, make sure everything is hooked up right. That's just the way it goes. And I did repair the line cord so it's not going through the uh, <laughs> the hole in the side of the chassis so that's all good that was an excellent first power up couldn't be happier where do we go from here well if I thought there was any chance whatsoever of these caps having some life left I could try to revive them reform them a term you may have heard before what does that mean? Electrolytic capacitors, the old ones, the new ones, they all have an issue where when they sit around, the chemicals inside kind of lose their mojo, I guess you could say. They need to kind of get uh, kick-started a little bit, sort of like a battery running down. 
Um, you need to put some voltage on them and slowly increase it till you reach the normal operating voltage while checking the leakage current. Ideally, as uh, you slowly increase the voltage, the leakage current will stay low or decrease as you form it up. You're building up, I believe, an oxide layer on either the cathode or the anode, I forget exactly which. So even a brand new cap like this, it's probably been a few years old now, it's just been sitting in my parts drawer. If I was to check the leakage current at 450 volts right now, it would initially be pretty bad, or at least it would exceed the specs, and then it should drop off till it's well within spec. For a new, modernish cap, that should happen in seconds or minutes. Cap that's been sitting around a few decades, that may take hours. Or it may never happen. These caps are so old, this one has lost its insides. There's no hope for them. I'm not going to bother. I'm going to electrically disconnect them, tack in a couple new caps, then try powering this back up. Now, of course, as I was going to form those up, I need to put a rectifier tube back in. I would set my variac at, say, 50 volts and slowly increase it while checking the current draw, check to see if these caps are getting hot, check to see if the power transformer is getting hot, check to see if the rectifier tube is red plating. But keep in mind, when you're only, say, got 50 volts going into the set, the filament voltage in the rectifier tube is going to be well below the normal 5 volts it should see. So it's not going to be working as well as it should. However, I've seen it de debated. It seems that even if these are only running on, say, 2 or 3 volts, they work well enough that you can start forming up the caps. I, I do believe so. It could be done. Uh, I'm not going to bother. I am going to uh, just quickly clip these out and tack in the new caps. Nothing fancy, no terminal strips, no restuffing. Just want to electrically proceed with this restoration project. Let's talk about the speaker for a moment. When I got this chassis, not only did it not have any tubes, it didn't have a speaker. The speaker that's currently in the cabinet is not the original. The chassis that's in that cabinet has been heavily modified and they also replaced the speaker with a newer one. They modified the speaker connector on the back where they replaced it with a different one. I'm not going to modify this chassis to use that speaker. Instead, I spent many, many months hunting down what I believe is the correct speaker. Now, not only is this model notable because of the departure from the usual coffin-type cabinets, and it's an early superheterodyne, it's also one of the earlier radios to use a compact field coil-type speaker, something you would recognize as a modern speaker. Typically, radios from the 20s used a horn, with like a, a, re, a vibrating reed type sound reproducer. They didn't have a movable paper cone. But this, this has all the elements of a modern speaker. We've got an output transformer, we've got a magnet, we've got a voice coil, we've got a paper cone that moves in and out. These are not the greatest speakers I've heard. Um, not only uh, as the frequency response not that great, but uh, I think they're prone to failure. So that's why it's a little hard to find them. Also, there are a number of models back then. There was the Model 20, the Model 70, the Model 90, and there were variations. Some had push-pull output, some had single-ended output. I, that's why I say I think this is the right speaker. It's got the right type of connector on it. Uh, it looks right, which is the pie plate type so rather than being a cone shape, it's a flat, looks like a, you know, a, a pie tin. Um, but I need to double check. I don't know if there's a part number on this. i got to make sure it's the right type of output transformer. I need to make sure it's good. I think it's been reconed. It looks to be in good shape. I had to pay a few bucks for it, um, so I'm really, really hoping it's good. All that being said, I don't want to damage it. So... I'm going to try to use something else, at least in the preliminary stages. 
So how might one do that? Well, very typically in a field coil speaker, they use the field coil as the filter choke on the power supply. This, so without the speaker, the radio gets no power. This radio is a little different. There's a dedicated filter choke. So without the speaker being connected, we will get B plus going to some parts on the set. Here is the speaker field coil. Now it is part of some of the power supply. These are the socket connections. There are three on the back. So you need to have that in place to complete the circuit to get power to the output transformer, which is mounted on the speaker, which also gives power to the plate on the audio output tube. So without this being connected, there is no plate voltage on the number 47 tube. And I, uh, otherwise, I think the rest of the set gets power. So how could you go about substituting something for this? Well, you could find another field coil speaker with an output transformer mounted on it that was close enough. Okay, I don't think I have one of those handy. So how can we use a modern permanent magnet cheapo speaker? Well, if we find out the DC resistance of this field coil, we can use a power resistor to substitute for it. It's not quite the same, um, but in a pinch it'll do. So say it's 1500 ohms resistance DC, get a 1500 ohm 10 watt power resistor, tack it in here. Okay, we need an output transformer. We can't put an 8 ohm speaker across here, it'll blow up. There's way too much voltage going across it. Uh, well, I happen to have a Hammond 125D, kind of a universal output transformer. I've used it in push-pull. Um, applications, I don't know it can do single-ended. I know it can do a lot. It's got a whole bunch of secondary taps for different impedances. And I think you can use different combinations on the primary. So, if this can do single-ended, like by using the blue and the brown wire and ignoring the red, we're going to try that. So, power resistor for the field coil, this for the output transformer, and for the speaker, I can try using this, which is just a Super cheapo, 8 ohm, I think 8 inch speaker. I use it all the time for testing stuff. And then I'll put this precious speaker to the side. I will check it for continuity, um, but I'd like to get it off the way. Just having it up here makes me nervous. <laughs> all right, so we want to replace these two electrolytic capacitors. This one has lost its guts. We know it's bad. We have to deal with that gunk on there. It's oozed out and made this nice crystalline mess on that lug. And this one, you need to be really careful. Not all capacitors go to the chassis, which is ground. That one does not. That's really common on early Philco radios. One or both of the filter caps will not go to ground. Let's take a look at the schematic again. Here are the two electrolytics. One of them does go to ground, the one on the right. The one on the left does not. Nor does the center tap on the power transformer. That's pin 12. What does it go to? It goes to that thing, which is a big multi-section power resistor. Pin 2, or the, the tappet called number 2, does go to ground. One does not. What does that do for you? If you were to take your multimeter and put the ground on the chassis and put the other probe on number 1, you're going to see it's a negative voltage. They use that to bias the grids on some of the tubes and the rest of the radio. Earlier, battery-powered radios would have had a C battery to generate negative voltage. You need a negative bias on the grids to get the tubes into their proper operating range. One way to do that is to set an artificial reference point by not grounding the center tap of the power transformer. What that does, in effect, is when the radio is working, current is going to flow from that center tap through that resistor to ground, which will make pin or point one on the power resistor negative. So that's why this cap, it's a little hard to see down here, but it is mounted on an insulated wafer. 
and the ground is actually this lug and there's an insulated lug coming up through the chassis that is the ground on this capacitor the other one it's the outside of the can let's try to take a closer look on this side so on both of these the can is the negative side of the electrolytic capacitor and this one is just going it's just mounted bare metal bare metal this that is an insulating wafer between the two and the ground lug it's a little metal tab coming off that can it goes through a hole through the insulation okay I need to replace those so how am I going to do it uh, I could drill a hole mount the terminal strip and, and hook, move the wires over to that I don't like doing that as I don't want to put a hole in the chassis and modify the wiring and all that I could restuff those cans um, for sure one of them is original and possibly both are that they do have part numbers on them I can I can double check that which means for a radio that's rare and those are visible because they're on top of the chassis maybe restuff them it's not that difficult to do but for now I would really prefer to just hack something in place so we can proceed so that's what I'm going to try doing. This one only has two wires going to it. There's the ground, which just goes right here. There's a positive that only has one wire. I think it's going right to the rectifier socket, which I think is that. So I can just tack like a capacitor right between these two lugs and just disconnect that wire for now. The other one, not so easy. Ground I can get anywhere. Uh, but the positive, so what I'll probably do is chip away at that blob, free up the wires, and just wire something in free space like this, wrap some electrical tape around it for now. Uh, eventually, I might do what I've done with some other Filcos, which is to use these, these guys. So for now, I'll go with these electrolytics. Either radial or axial doesn't really matter. These are have longer leads, so they're have more flexibility with mounting them. But these are motor run capacitors, polypropylene, I do believe. Not to be compared uh, confused with motor start capacitors, which only are good for a surge current. These are motor run, which means they're designed to have AC current going through them for extended periods. These will last forever, and they can take a lot of punishment. They're also exactly the same diameter as the originals. Now, on some Filco radios and other brands, they have a mounting collar, like a hose clamp that goes around and tightens down. These are awesome for that because they fit right into that clamp. You can tighten, tighten it down, hook up your wires down below, you're good to go. So this is just for mounting. This doesn't have any electrical connection. If there was a hole in the chassis, you could put it through there, put a nut on it, and connect your wires up. Uh, in this case, we don't really have that. So unless I added a clamp to it, I'm not quite sure I could use these. But I'd sure like to. Uh, 8 microfarad. They don't give you a DC rating, but if they're rated for upwards of 470 volts AC, I'm sure they have even higher DC ratings. And these are rated for very long life, so... Yeah, they're, uh, I think, like $8 each or something like that. But, like I said, they can take the abuse. They will last forever. If you really want to go to the extreme. But these will work just fine. Get them for less than a buck a piece. No problems there. So that's what we're going to do next. Um, and then we'll try powering it up and see what B plus we get. There's one capacitor tacked into place. That's um, the number one lug on the power resistor. That's where the negative side goes, not to the chassis. And the other positive side, I disconnected the wire from the positive lug on the cap and tacked it onto this. So it's just floating in free space, not safe. I'll wrap some electrical tape around that for now, which leaves this guy. So there's a lot of crust on there from the 
borax solution that leaked out and crystallized. So I'm going to chip away at that to try to get down to some bare metal. I'll try to heat it up. I could probably put some water on that too and maybe dissolve it, but I don't really want to get any moisture in the chassis. Kept at it with the dissolving and poking and prodding and chipping and finally everything is unraveling. So one wire left. There we go. Nasty. Nasty. That's what you gotta deal with sometimes in these old radios. I notice both of these caps are held on by giant nuts. Uh, it's a little tough to get in there at them. They're like one inch nuts. Because uh, you got, for example, this chassis tab here. So you can't get like a giant deep well socket on there. It's just not going to work. Uh, channel locks, maybe. That's what I'll try doing. Nah, before we grab a wrench, let's try the most straightforward approach, which is to just grab it from the top side. And yeah, I'll get this 47 tube out of the way. So it doesn't get damaged. Certainly looser. Doesn't seem to want to come out nut spinning underneath. Alrighty, yeah, the nut was spinning on the other side. Got a grip on it now. And up she comes. There it is. It's a gooey grandeur. It's a 30-2061. Huh. You know, in hindsight, this is old enough, early enough. This probably had Mershon type caps originally, which are beautiful copper type caps. So I worked on a Philco from 32, model 15 DX, and that uh, that had those Mershon type caps, and this is even earlier. So neither one of these is original. I think there are some databases online of Philco parts where I could perhaps look up all these part numbers and get some insight. I know there's one that has all the speakers they ever made listed. puzzles me though because it's got the insulating wafer and all that and it fits perfectly into a hole in the chassis. So man, I gotta believe this is the original. So the part number on this is 4916S. Okay, yeah, 4916. So that is, that does match the part number. And the S probably means something to do with that insulation insulation on it, I'm guessing. Let's see, they're rather different types. So perhaps I was mistaken all along and this is actually a newer replacement and this is an original type. <laughs> Might be a little bit of fluid left in here, but it sounds more like a maraca than a capacitor at this point. Let's take a look at the top side of the chassis for a moment. It is dusty. I will take a brush and some compressed air and go over it at some point. There might be a little corrosion here and there. I'm not going to be painting it. I'm not going to be polishing or plating it or anything like that. Just get the dirt off. See somebody's written the tube numbers on it at some point. Tube shield, so uh, this was missing both, I believe, when I got it. Uh, I think one of these is a Philco type and one is not. It just happened to be the right diameter. It would be nice to track down a match set, but not crucial. You see I do have globe tubes in here. They're actually Philco branded, so I'm pretty darn sure that this is a period correct tube. 
as would have come with this radio. Why are these in shields? To prevent them from picking up interference and also from oscillating the feeding signals into or picking up signals from nearby tubes. So here's where those two capacitors were mounted. I'd mentioned about how nice these potentially can be to use, because check this out. Not only are they the same diameter externally, but the uh, inner diameter fits perfectly into these holes. <laughs> so how cool is that? Now, if there was just a way to secure them below, that would be perfect. And these could be painted silver if one really wanted them to, to blend in better, but Boy, it's a neat, it's a neat option if it can just be made to work, and then you can just very easily connect your wires down below. Now the tuning assembly, this big four section variable cap up here. Notice this whole sub assembly is very loose. Originally, it was mounted on some rubber shock mounts. Why to insulate it from vibration? Just like I mentioned, um, the tubes can be microphonic and pick up vibrations and cause interference. Well, same with this. This is carefully set to be on the station you want to listen to, and if this vibrated with the speaker in the cabinet, you could vary the uh, local oscillator a little bit, which would cause distortion in the sound. Now, those rubber mounts are completely rotted away and need to be replaced. I have not done a Filco of this vintage before. I'm not exactly sure where they're located. I think they're below the chassis. I'll have to look through my stash and see what I have on hand. Notice the uh, there are things sticking up all on this side. Those are trimmers. When we go through the alignment we'll need to tweak all of those. So at least on newer radios one of these will typically be a band pass for the antenna uh, and then the local oscillator. Now this has four sections so I'm not entirely sure what that's all about. We can take a quick look at the schematic though. So those dashed lines are the ganged tuner. So there is, it looks like there's two up front on the antenna. And one on the local oscillator, of course. And then one between the RF and the first detector. There might be another band pass. Hmm. Well, that'll be interesting. We'll figure out more about that when we go through the alignment procedure. But I just wanted to give you a little tour of the chassis. Well, let's go through the rest of it. So that's the antenna input. Ground, and this is insulated from the chassis. That's where you're long wire antenna comes in, that's where the speaker plugs in, there's your power cord hole for uh, alignment and there are several more scattered around the chassis these are IF cans as are these or they could be antenna coupling or they could be local oscillators but these are all coils inside these shields this is the IF section underneath this shield there are three tubes underneath there a variable cap power transformer, and that's where the output tube would be, rectifier tube, and I think a Type 27 goes in there. I just finished wiring a couple more components. Let me catch you up. Both electrolytic filter caps have been replaced now. One of them is going between the rectifier tube filament and filter choke and the center tap on the power transformer, not ground. It's one on the left. One on the right, the other side of the filter choke and ground. That is this guy, that's the one that was on that terminal that was all corroded. So after getting that cap out, I took the three wires, twisted them together, and tacked in my cap through some electrical tape on it for insulation. For ground, I took a ground lug off of the big power resistor divider down there, and I threw 
a little bit of insulation over the bare lead. That is heat shrink tubing. Something else I didn't mention earlier that I use all the time is this stuff. I just got a big spool of it. I slide this over component leads all the time. I don't think there's any chance of them brushing up against anything. Not to be confused with spaghetti tubing, which serves a similar purpose, but it does not shrink. This does shrink a bit. Uh, I picked a diameter such that it's easy to slide over virtually any component gauge, and even when it shrinks a little bit with the heat, you can still usually slide it around pretty well. Get a big spool of it for a few bucks. Good stuff to have. And again, that's all temporary. So those are those two caps. And my filter, sorry, field coil substitute. Turns out it goes between this end of the big power resistor and B+, which goes to this junction here. So after this filter cap, it goes up into this blob. Now both, of, both ends of these, these wire, wire here and this connection here, are going to this plug. I believe it's these top two terminals. So I could have stuck my power resistor externally. Um, occasionally I do uh, take a dud tube and bust off the base just for the pins. Those would fit in here perfectly but I don't have any handy and I want to keep this simple so I didn't. Uh, but that's certainly a, uh, a neater way to go is to make up a plug from uh, pins that you bust out of tubes. In fact I think this tube, not that tube. Where's a four pin tube? Here we go. I think this would actually fit in there. Yeah, that is just a standard four pin tube socket they used for that. So you can imagine if this was a dud tube, I could break the glass, clean out the remains, and use this base for a plug and stick my parts into it. And then plug it in there, and I wouldn't have to mess around with the chassis. That would be a neater way to, to, to do it, but I'm not going to right now. All right, so we're almost ready for another power up. What uh, I want to do last is hook up that Hammond transformer. So that needs to go the primary between uh, the uh, B plus uh, point right there. We trace it around and around and around. It uh, connects up there. I think I misspoke earlier. I thought that the field coil fed the primary, but now upon closer inspection, one end of the field coil and one end of the primary on the output transformer are connected together. They both go to B+. If you're not familiar with that term, B+, is your main positive supply for the radio. The name comes from the battery days. Back in the day, your A battery would be for filament, and your B battery would be your main plate supply, and the C battery would be your bias. Ignore the A and the B up there. They just use that nomenclature for filament designators. It has nothing to do with the B plus or the ABC of the old battery days. That's why we call it B plus. So... I need to hook up the primary of my substitute output transformer. One side goes to B+, the other side goes to the plate on the output tube. And notice it's going to a bank of three caps and this odd looking thing. That is the tone control. That is this guy. There are three caps buried in there. And there's a rotary switch. And there's a wire coming out here. Snakes all around. This guy down here, that is going to the plate of the Type 47 tube down there. That's where our output transformer needs to go. And luckily that also goes to this plug. That is this pin right here. So one side of my output transformer goes to that. And the other side goes to that. B plus, plate of the output tube. And then my speaker goes to the secondary. I grab a box. Uh, some wire that we can use for hookup. Got a whole bunch of stuff in here. Some reproduction cloth covered. Some plastic. We'll just go with this for now. Uh, 
Alrighty, it is hooked up. Two primary wires, brown and blue, going between B plus and a plate of the 47 tube. Secondary, there's this whole decoder chart on the side. I believe this is an 8 ohm speaker. I don't know exactly what the primary uh, impedance is, so I just picked something in the middle and I went with going between pins 2 and 5 which is assuming like an 8200 ohm um, primary impedance. This isn't rocket science. We're just trying to get some sound out of the speaker. We can be way off. It'll still do something. Now obviously this is a very unwieldy hookup, so before long I'm going to have to rig up something. I probably will end up uh, rigging up a plug, but for now we can move on. We're going to power this up. Every tube is in place, including the 80 rectifier. Uh, I can operate this radio on its side pretty easily because the power transformer makes a nice stable base. I am going to uh, grab some alligator clips and hook up my digital voltmeter to B+, and we're going to turn this on. What do I think is going to happen? I think we're going to hear a crackle, and maybe some hum out of the speaker. Um, probably that'll be about it. Uh, without an antenna, I'm not going to get much reception. These need a long antenna. Um, if I turn it on and everything seems stable, I'll grab a long wire and clip it to the antenna lead, and then maybe, just maybe, we'll get some reception. Alright, here we go. All the tubes are populated. Radio is off. Variac on. Got this on B+. Plus. Radio on. Current uh, draw dropped it down to about 117. We got a crack out of the speaker. We got B plus of about 205. Tubes are a glowing. As the tubes start warming up, they're going to start conducting. I expect that B plus is going to a little bit. So this is the volume control, which may be a replacement. Yeah, well, huh. Show you the volume control in a minute. I think it used to have a power switch attached to it. I'm pretty sure it's not original. Alright, tuning. We're on the dial now. Turning the tone control. Exactly expecting anything to really to hear any sound out of it, but crackles are good. Crackles are good. Steady B plus is good. Lower than I expected, though. Let's see. Where's our print out? Yeah, they indicate some voltages around the set of upwards of 270 volts. So uh, I expect um, one of several things. One, uh, some of these caps could be leaky, in which case they're going to start getting warm, so you got current flowing through them. You could start getting waxed ooze. Um, I have not checked some of these tubes. Some are new old stock, like the 47 output tube is supposedly brand new. Some of these tubes are used, have not tested them. Um, they might not be working right. Resistors, I can guarantee most, if not all of them, have drifted pretty far off values so tubes are not biased correctly. Uh, between the bias points being off, potentially weak tubes, and potentially leaky caps. Ooh. That didn't sound good. Although our B plus didn't change much. Uh, but between all that, I would not expect this to work. So the local oscillator might not be running. Um, we could have the signal might not be getting coupled between stages right and so on. Hmm, not sure what that pop was. Could have been uh, transient short somewhere.
Well, the one thing I can do is to take a screwdriver and stick it on the side of the volume control. Cool. That means we have got amplification. I'm actually touching it with my finger now. And it varies. Excellent. That tells us a whole lot. That tells us one, our output transformer and speaker are working enough that it's reproducing sound. Our output tube is working. We are amplifying. So I was just touching at, where is the volume control on this thing at this point? So basically we know our 27 detector amplifier, our 27 first amplifier, and 47. The signal's cutting through. And we're getting some amplification. The volume varied as I varied this control. So from here on we know that it's at least partially functioning. Over here, if I had a scope, I could check to see the local oscillator was running, but we're going to keep this bare bones. So, uh, where to go from here? Um, I'll check some of the resistors around here and some voltages. I don't like the fact that B plus is so low. I can also smell heat. Something is getting toasty. So I'm going to just go along with my finger and see what what is getting toasty off. Um, I'm not worried about discharging it with this kind of stuff. Generally after a few seconds the caps are basically discharged. Let's see if any of these paper caps are getting warm. No. My substitute field coil resistor is a touch warm. But it's a 10 watt resistor I think maybe a 13 watt and it's not so hot I can't put my finger on it, so that I don't think was getting hot enough for me to smell. Big power resistor down here. Not really warm. Now it can be deceiving. So this big looking power resistor down here looks massive, but components back then couldn't take as much heat. For example, that I believe is a 1 watt resistor, and these are half watt. Even though they're huge, that's a 10 watt resistor. That is a 1 watt resistor. I don't think there are any 2 watters in here. Uh, so, what, what was getting warm? Still haven't found anything that. Everything's just cold. Might have been a tube. A tube just burning off some dust. Sorry, I don't have a nifty thermal camera. That would have been handy. Huh, even the 80 rectifier tube and 47 output tube are not all that hot. Huh. Yeah, that's why sometimes you just gotta let things run for a while until you see a little smoke to try to figure out where the, where the heck the problem might be.